CT imaging studies are performed to answer a question, and answering that question requires us to look for particular CT imaging findings. Our odds of successfully seeing or confidently saying we didn't see a particular CT imaging finding can be substantially improved by how we acquire the study when the patient's in the CT scanner and how we manipulate and present the imaging data afterwards. Specific parameters and techniques, especially with regards to the use of contrast agents, tailored to the particular clinical question and to the patient, are collectively referred to as a CT protocol. CT protocols are not one-size-fits-all. The CT protocol for kidney stones is very different from the CT protocol for kidney cancer. How complex a protocol is may vary by imaging modality and body part. MR protocols are generally more elaborate than CT protocols, and abdominal CT protocols tend to be more complex than chest CT protocols. A big reason why abdominal CT protocols are more complex than chest CT protocols is because there are many more potential variables involved including the field of coverage of a scan, the amount of radiation dose to use, and the number of scans that will be required. We need to decide whether we'll use intravenous contrast or not, and if we do, how long do we need to wait between the IV contrast injection and CT scan, and how many scans do we need to do after the contrast injection. We also need to decide whether we need oral contrast or not, and if so, what type. Fields of coverage can vary. For abdominal pelvic CTs where the liver needs to be entirely imaged, our scan will need to begin just above the domes of the diaphragm and go all the way through to the ischial tuberosities of the bony pelvis. Sometimes the entire liver doesn't need to be imaged, such as in an abdominal pelvic CT for urinary tract calculi. In these cases, the scan may start from mid-liver instead, which can help reduce the radiation dose a patient receives. And sometimes, there may be no need to image the pelvis at all, and a scan may start just above the domes of the diaphragm or mid-liver and stop at the anterior superior iliac spines. Radiation doses used for abdominal CT imaging may be standard, low, or ultra-low. Low and ultra-low dose imaging is generally reserved for urinary tract calculi cases only. Intravenous contrast is not always desirable for an abdominal CT. Sometimes, enhancement may actually interfere with our ability to see a relevant imaging finding, such as calcifications, macroscopic fat in a tumor, or subtle inflammatory stranding in the fat around an organ or other structure. We may also choose to go without intravenous contrast in patients with renal insufficiency or an anaphylactic allergy to IV contrast. However, a lot of the time we do prefer to use intravenous contrast when CTing the abdomen. And when we do, timing really matters. Different pathologies may enhance more or less than background normal tissue after intravenous contrast administration. And this differentiation could peak early, late, or at some midpoint after the IV injection occurs. An organ where this is particularly noticeable is the liver. It's not unusual to encounter a situation where two liver lesions of different etiology may be present that are imperceptible on non-contrast imaging. However, once intravenous contrast is administered and the normal background liver begins to enhance, the enhancement in one lesion may peak very early, only to become indistinguishable as the background liver catches up. And as the intravenous contrast begins to wash out of the normal background liver, a different lesion may hang on to the contrast longer and become more perceptible relative to background normal liver after more time has passed. For this reason, enhanced abdominal CT protocols may sometimes require scans at more than one time point after IV contrast injection. Let's go on a deeper dive into intravenous contrast timing. Intravenous contrast is usually introduced into the bloodstream via an angiocath in an upper extremity vein or via the distal tip of a central venous catheter in the SVC. In a patient with relatively normal cardiac output, 
intravenous contrast will have reached the right atrium by around 5 seconds after the injection began. By the 7 second mark, intravenous contrast will have reached the pulmonary artery. And by the 12 second mark, contrast will have passed through the pulmonary capillaries and reached the pulmonary veins and left atrium. By the 15 second mark, the left ventricle has already propelled contrast into the aorta in most people. We refer to this as the early arterial phase of enhancement. At this point, contrast is only present in the arteries, and there is little, if any, enhancement of the organs and other soft tissues in the abdomen, which makes for clean CT angiograms to look at and for vascular software tools to work on. At 30 seconds after injection, contrast has entered the visceral arteries of the abdomen, such as the hepatic arteries, mesenteric arteries, and renal arteries, and the enhancement of the organs they supply has begun. This is the late arterial phase of enhancement, and tends to be a good time to catch lesions that parasitize direct arterial supply, such as HCCs, liver mets, RCCs, pancreatic malignancies, and some GI tumors. At the 60 second mark, we've entered the enteric phase of enhancement, where enhancement of the GI tract is most optimal. At 70 seconds, we've reached the portal venous phase of enhancement, when the liver enhancement is predominantly being driven by contrast that passed through the bowel and is now arriving via the portal vein. At 100 seconds after injection, we've reached the nephrographic phase of enhancement. Enhancement of normal renal parenchyma will probably appear as homogeneous as it will be at this point. And this tends to be a good time to pick up small RCCs. At five minutes after injection, the kidneys have begun concentrating and excreting contrast into the renal collecting systems and ureters. And this dense contrast has also begin, begun to accumulate within the urinary bladder. This is the renal excretory phase of enhancement. By the five minute mark, contrast will have pretty much washed out of all the abdominal organs and soft tissues entirely, except for maybe scar tissue, which tends to hold on to contrast a little longer. At 15 minutes after injection, we've reached the late renal excretory phase of enhancement where in patients with normal renal function, a lot more contrast has been concentrated and excreted into the renal collecting systems, ureters, and urinary bladder. And the rest of the abdomen has returned to its non-contrast appearance. If you're looking at CT images of the abdomen, the phase of enhancement may not always be clearly labeled. So you should be able to recognize the phase your images are in it's always important to know what phase the images you're looking at were acquired because certain pathologic imaging findings are more likely to, to be masked on some phases and more likely to stand out in other phases. If there's no enhancement within the aorta, no enhancement within the kidneys, and no dense contrast within the urinary bladder, you're looking at a non-contrast scan. If the aorta is enhanced, but there's minimal or no enhancement of the kidneys, you're looking at an early arterial phase scan. If the aorta is enhanced and you see a cortical medullary enhancement pattern within the kidneys, you're looking at a late arterial phase scan. Since renal malignancies can sometimes get masked by the renal cortical medullary enhancement pattern during the late arterial enhancement phase, this is not such a good phase to be looking at if you're concerned about a renal malignancy. If the aorta is enhanced and the kidneys are more uniformly enhanced, though a slight cortical medullary pattern is still discernible, you're looking at an enteric or portal venous phase scan. If the aorta is enhanced and the kidneys are very uniformly enhanced, you're looking at a nephrographic phase scan. If there is minimal or no aortic enhancement, renal parenchymal enhancement is subtle, and there's dense contrast within the renal pelvis and ureters, 
you're looking at a renal excretory phase scan. The situation with oral or enteric contrast is more straightforward. You may forego oral contrast sometimes, perhaps because it's a trauma situation or maybe because it's a renal stone case where you're convinced oral contrast doesn't matter. However, use of oral contrast is typically the default and you'll choose standard oral contrast, which makes the bowel lumen appear whiter or higher in attenuation and easier to distinguish from everything else going on in the abdomen. In a small number of cases, you'll opt for hyperosmolar negative oral contrast, which makes the bowel lumen appear darker or lower in attenuation. Hyperosmolar oral contrast agents allow us to see the bowel wall on a CT scan nicely since they draw water into the GI lumen. Increased water in the GI lumen not only helps distend the bowel more fully, but it also increases the attenuation difference between bowel wall and bowel wall, um, contents. The use of hyperosmolar oral contrast agents is however associated with some side effects such as cramping, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Now that we have the basics down, let's go through some examples of abdominal CT protocols you might encounter, which we can split into specific and generic protocols. Specific abdominal CT protocols are tailored for a particular organ of interest and used when the referring provider is able to localize their primary clinical question to a specific organ. Three specific abdominal CT protocols that address the liver are the standard liver protocol, post-chemoembolization protocol, and cholangiocarcinoma protocol. The standard liver protocol is typically used for general liver assessment, HCC screening, and when we're concerned about liver metastases. Since different liver lesions and disorders can exhibit different enhancement patterns and enhancement dynamics, Three contrast-enhanced scans are performed at different points in time, one during the late arterial phase, one during the portal venous phase, and one at a more delayed phase at around three minutes. Late arterial phase scans can sometimes help with things like HCCs, for example, while delayed scans might be of help with hepatic hemangiomas. The post-chemoembolization protocol is used in patients with HCC who've been chemoembolized by interventional radiology. Since chemoembolic material is hyper-attenuating, abnormal soft tissue enhancement might be difficult to visually distinguish from chemoembolic material on some scans. Consequently, the post-chemoembolization protocol consists of a standard liver protocol with the addition of a non-contrast scan. Cholangiocarcinomas are different than most other liver malignancies in that they exhibit considerably more delayed contrast enhancement than other liver lesions. As a result, the cholangiocarcinoma protocol consists of a standard liver, call, liver protocol with the addition of a very delayed scan. The adrenal protocol is used for characterizing indeterminate adrenal nodules and also for assessing their stability or growth. Conventionally, an adrenal protocol CT begins with a non-contrast scan that's checked by a radiologist. If the adrenal nodule demonstrates features characteristic for an adrenal adenoma on the non-contrast scan, meaning the nodule is under 10 Hounsfield units and homogeneous, the study is concluded. If not, enhanced scans are then done during the portal venous phase and after a 15-minute delay. These two enhanced scans allow us to calculate an adrenal nodule's absolute and relative percentage contrast washout, which are used to determine if a nodule might be benign. Three specific abdominal CT protocols that target the kidney are the STONE protocol, renal mass protocol, and post-renal neoplasm resection protocol. The STONE protocol is a non-contrast CT through the abdomen and pelvis that's used to either rule out a urinary tract calculus or follow up on a known urinary tract calculus. Scans for the former are done using low radiation dose technique, while scans of the latter can be done using ultra low radiation dose technique. These low dose techniques permit visualization of a stone, 
but may be noisy and result in suboptimal assessment of other abdominal organs and tissues, so it's important to know that going in. The renal mass protocol is used to investigate known renal masses that might have been incidentally discovered, for example during a chest CT or an ultrasound study. Three scans are made through the abdomen, one non-contrast scan and two contrast-enhanced scans one during the nephrographic phase of enhancement, and one during the excretory phase of enhancement. The post-renal neoplasm resection protocol is used in patients who've undergone a partial nephrectomy for renal malignancy and consists of one non-contrast scan and one enhanced scan during the nephrographic phase of enhancement. Since we want to get a good look at the entire liver to rule out liver metastases, it's particularly important that post-renal neoplasm resection protocol abdominal CT scans completely cover the liver. The urinary tract protocol is used in situations where we want to do our best to exclude a neoplasm along the lining of the urinary tract. And common indications may include hematuria, gross or microscopic, and urinary bladder cancer history. A non-contrast scan is performed, followed by enhanced scans during the nephrographic and excretory phases. Three specific abdominal CT protocols that target the bowel are the standard bowel protocol, bowel mast protocol, and GI bleed or ischemia protocol. A common indication for the standard bowel protocol is inflammatory bowel disease. The standard bowel protocol is a single enhanced abdominal pelvic CT scan during the portal venous phase of enhancement after hyperosmolar negative oral contrast has been administered. The bowel mass protocol is used in situations where a bowel mass is suspected. Indications may also include occult GI bleed or iron deficiency anemia. As with the standard bowel protocol, hyperosmolar negative oral contrast is administered. Unlike the standard bowel protocol, however, several scans are performed for the bowel mass protocol. A non-contrast scan and two enhanced scans during the early arterial phase and enteric phase of enhancement. The GI bleed or ischemia protocol may be used in the setting of an active GI bleed or mesenteric ischemia. It consists of a non-contrast scan and two enhanced scans during the early arterial phase and portal venous phase. Two specific abdominal CT protocols that target the pancreas are the standard pancreas protocol and the IPNM protocol. Performed for a known pancreatic lesion, the standard pancreas protocol consists of three scans, a non-contrast scan and two enhanced scans during the pancreatic arterial phase and portal venous phase of enhancement. If the pancreatic lesion is a pancreatic cancer, it's very important that the entire pelvis is imaged during imaging. Water will often be used as a negative oral contrast agent, which can help the radiologist distinguish between duodenum and pancreas a little better. The IPMN protocol, usually done for pancreatic IPMN follow-up, consists of a non-contrast scan and an enhanced scan during the portal venous phase. Generic abdominal CT protocols can provide an overall assessment of the abdomen and pelvis as a whole, and are not specifically tailored to any organ in particular. Generic enhanced abdominal pelvic CT protocols are usually a single phase scan during the portal venous phase of enhancement. Standard oral contrast is typically administered unless there's a contraindication. Generic enhanced protocol abdominal pelvic CTs are commonly used when patients are being worked up for appendicitis, diverticulitis, bowel obstruction, trauma, pancreatitis, and post-op pancreatic surgery. In situations where a contraindication to intravenous contrast exists, this protocol may be performed as is, except without intravenous contrast. <laughs>